Across Europe, the far right is breaking into the political mainstream. Extremist parties are gaining support and forming coalitions within the government. Catherine Fieschi is Director of Policy and Strategic Outreach at Open Society Foundations, focusing on Europe and Central Asia. And she joins Hari Srinivasan to discuss this moment in European politics. And this interview is part of Exploring Hate, our ongoing series on anti-Semitism, racism and extremism. Christian, thanks. Catherine Fieschi, thanks so much for joining us. First, I guess for maybe our American audience uh, and our overseas audience, kind of set the landscape for us a little bit. When we think about the political right or the far right, how is it gaining ground in Europe? So I think in Europe, um, to some extent, it's been gaining ground probably from the early 80s in various places, first in France, then in Italy, um, then, you know, gradually more and more the Scandinavian countries. Now we even have um, Germany. Of course, there's the tales of Poland and Hungary. And what we see is that, you know, in a very basic way, the way that they're gaining ground is that they are either in some places the most important uh, opposition uh, party, or they're in coalition government, or uh, or they're basically, you know, getting ready for government. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a very basic measure. They're winning elections, right? Um, and I would say that, you know, the other measure is that possibly, you know, they have become the parties that have set the agenda, whether it's on migration and increasingly on the environment, um, whether or not they're actually in government, they are managing to set the agenda for uh, for the whole of the political scene and the political landscape. So the combination of the two means that we're now in actually what I think is quite a dangerous situation in Europe. So let's go maybe country by country here. Um, let's start with Italy right now. Uh, it's a dominant uh, far right party that is in control. How do we get there? Well, we get there. Um, Italy is is a really interesting case because um, you know we get there in Italy through a number of ways. There's been a long kind of uh, slow rise of all sorts of challenger parties, right? You know, we had um, the, the the radical left, and then the rise of the radical right, then the radical right and the radical left in coalition together, uh, and, and then you know a kind of technocratic, more stable government. And I think, you know, what we see in Italy is that, you know, this kind of very technocratic government in Italy, as in elsewhere, you know, generally we we know that this is the kind of precursor for people reacting to policies who uh, which they think are, you know, kind of taken without the interest of the people in mind and, you know, um, essentially too technical, too opaque, um, too disconnected from what ordinary people. Mm -hmm things politics is about. So this is what we have in Italy. And we have a, a coalition, which is really interesting because it's got a dominant, in a sense, ultra conservative, neo fascist party, uh, you know, as the the main uh, coalition partner with uh, with Giorgia Meloni. She's definitely uh, the most important, most uh, if you like, popular party in Italy. She doesn't quite have the votes to do it on her own, so she's had to cobble together this coalition. So you've got this weird-looking coalition of people who don't particularly like each other sort yeah. of to govern together. What are the issues that are animating the rise of the far right in Germany and Austria? I mean, countries that have for so long dealt with Nazi history and really to run 180 degrees from it for decades. We tend to put them together, but actually the stories are really uh, quite different because, you know, what's shocking about Germany is the fact that actually Germany has, uh, in a sense, you know, done a lot in education terms, um, in, you know, in, in its cultural life, in its kind of collective narrative to really come to terms uh, with its past, to really own it, to move beyond it. And so the rise of the IFD and, you know, a political option on on, you know, on the far right is something, you know, that is um, that is still very shocking to uh, to a lot of people. And it's a very it's it's a relatively recent phenomenon, uh, the IFD. day. And I think that, you know, one of the things that we know about Germany is that Germany is going through a lot of transitions at once. Um, you know, it's um, 
first of all, uh, Merkel, who had been in power for a long time, is no longer there. So it's, it was a transition away from her. Uh, then, uh, you know, it's had to really sort of, you know, revise its attitude toward its energy policy, its attitude toward Russia, uh, whom it had tried to, you know, treat as a partner. Um, it's going through a rough time economically. And of course, the I day is something that is based mostly uh, in uh, the former East Germany, um, where, you know, economic conditions are, in any case, even on a good day, uh, nowhere near as good as in, you know, in, in what we might still call West Germany. So there is an there's an economic backlash there. But also, I think, you know, a slight uh, backlash, a kind of a nostalgic knee jerk reaction, because mm. um, Germany is feeling as low it's losing its its footing a little bit there is the the national narrative is being called into question in all sorts of ways austria on the other hand i mean we have to keep in mind that you know austria didn't do all of that work that germany did uh on its own on its own past right it tried to it tried to bypass that kind of collective consciousness and and owning of the past in order to do better and actually the far right was you know um the fpo uh, which is the far right party, I mean, was actually in power in Austria back in 2000, right? That's the first time that it was, uh, that it, it already sort of, you know, became important. Um, so they've ebbed and flowed since, but they've been an option on, you know, on the electoral map, um, you know, for essentially the, the better part of 40 years uh, at this point. You know, there's also this idea that, listen, if... These are the leaders that people elect. That's kind of the bargain we signed up for with democracy, that these are people and parties that are able to make the case better, that they're able to win hearts and minds. Now, underlying that is the notion that it's a fair fight, that it's a level playing field. I mean, what's your response to that? I think that... Um... You know, increasingly, it, it hasn't necessarily become a fair fight or uh, and it's less and less of a level playing field, because I would argue that, you know, many, uh, many political leaders who are not part of these parties, whether on the they're on the mainstream left or the mainstream right. Um, you know, they will hesitate to use, you know, some of the tactics that these that these parties use. Right. So, you know, uh, I, I would argue that most of us, um, you know, however we lean, most of us who are in the kind of the mainstream of politics, you know, we probably would not, in a sense, wouldn't have the heart and actually would feel pretty immoral using the kind of tactics that, that they use. For example, we feel bad about lying and being caught lying. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, you look at uh, you look at a Meloni, you look at a Marine Le Pen, uh, you know, you look at an Orban, they really don't care, you know, if they're caught out, you know, in a big lie, they, they sort of shrug and say, well, that just goes to show that I'm willing to do anything, you know, to actually defend the interests of the people, right? I'm not hemmed in by these bourgeois constitutional considerations. Uh, you know, I'm a man of the people, I defend the people. And if it takes lying, a lie, right? So these are things that, you know, just that we're just not very uh, keen to adopt, you know, in terms of in terms of tactics. But the other thing that I would say is, and you've put your finger on it, it's an important point. It's very hard to argue that these parties are not democratic parties. Um, you know, it's very hard to say that these, uh, some of these leaders or the, you know, the, the way that they get elected is anti-democratic anti-democratic. And I've always been very careful about saying that actually they're not anti-democratic. They're they're just espousing a kind of democracy, the kind of democracy that we don't like, which is a kind of, you know, uh, an oppressive will of the majority to the exclusion of every minority view. And of course, this is you know, this is a big problem in societies like ours that are diverse societies, uh, you know, where, in a sense, the the social contract that we have in our democracies is that, you know, you you win some, you lose some, you know, you're not always on the losing side, you're not always on the winning side. But, you know, by and large, you know, everyone has a voice. The kind of democracy that they put forward is the one that 
you know, that the founding fathers, uh, you know, the American founding fathers, you know, warned us against, which is, you know, one that is simply an oppressive uh, majority, right? Um, so I think that, you know, the, the as you say, uh, this may be a democratic expression. The, the final point, if I may, on, on this is that one of the things that we see is that once these parties are uh, in the game, whether they are, you know, a credible opposition or whether they're part of government or whether they're leading government, they get their hands on some key institutions, which basically means that the game from then on is rigged. If mm. we look at, you know, somebody like Orban, for example, there is no media freedom, there is no, uh, you know, uh, judicial freedom. Uh, and therefore, in a sense, you can shape reality uh, to to your own to your own needs, people think they're voting for something, but you know they're not getting the whole story because you control the story. And we're seeing this in Poland, uh, and we're seeing this increasingly in Italy, and we're even seeing it, you know, increasingly uh, in in France. Once they have power, they get their hands on the levers, and then they shape the reality that people that people will see. So the choice is not a real choice. You know, as you lay out these characteristics, I'm listening and I'm saying, hmm, capture of the judiciary and capture of the press leads to an unfair fight going forward. And of course, I have to apply this to the United States. And I wonder, what are the lessons that are kind of going back and forth? Is there almost an ecosystem of support because I have never seen as much interest in Hungarian politics as I did over the last few years in the conservative media in the United States and espousing and supporting Viktor Orban, who maybe two administrations ago would have been considered an authoritarian dictator. Uh, but here we are. But I think that one of the things that we shouldn't underestimate is actually um, the links between these leaders and the links between these parties. You know, when CPAC starts to organize, um, you know, events in Europe, including in, in Hungary, it means that, you know, that there is money flowing behind it, that the, you know, certain uh, media outlets are are lining up, uh, you know, behind this kind of transatlantic cooperation. It stretches across from the United States uh, and, uh, and, and Europe. Um, and I think that, you know, this suggests to me that what many of us thought for a long time, um, which is that because we're talking about nationalist parties, they would never cooperate with one another out of yeah. nationalism, if you like. In fact, you know, they're starting to see that, you know, cooperation, you know, has its has its rewards. And this could well happen, you know, at the level of Europe as well, uh, in the aftermath of the European elections, parliamentary elections, which are taking place in June 2024. One of the things that we worry about is, you know, some of these far right or right wing populist parties, you know, really um, getting huge scores, particularly pushing back on quite a sophisticated and expensive environmental policy agenda. Um, you know, and at that point, you know, the fear is that they will cooperate with each other uh, much more effectively uh, and that they will cooperate with the mainstream right, right? You know, that what we'll see is a kind of um, an increase in the radicalization even of mainstream right parties who stand to gain from associating with the harder right. Traditionally, one of the platform planks of a far-right party in Europe or elsewhere has been tied to a certain nationalism, has been easily identified as somebody who cares about the other, and that might be the immigrant, that might be the somebody who's coming in from outside to take jobs, et cetera. And I wonder if you're seeing different minority communities even within and what I'm thinking of right now is, say, kind of anti-LGBTQ legislation, not just in the United States, but also in parts of Europe, um, or even really attacks on women's rights in places that we thought were otherwise progressive safe havens. Absolutely. Um, you know, um, 
I think that in in you know Orban probably set the tone uh, on you know uh, on this early on, not just anti-immigrant, anti-Roma, but also uh, you know um, very much pushing back on you know equal women's um, women's rights. Um, certainly, the the pol- in the Polish case on abortion, which has been a huge issue uh, in Poland, with the the current government, you know, really trying to crack down on it, and you know, Polish citizens really trying to 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 push back. But you know, where we also see it, where I think it's very interesting, is in the Scandinavian countries, right? So Scandinavian countries that have always been kind of you know trailblazers um, in terms of particular particularly women's rights, uh, the pushback in a place like uh, Finland or Sweden isn't just on on immigrants, but it's also on the fact that, you know, the other here is the women who have taken the service jobs, right? Um, and, and, you know, in a, in a way it makes sense. It's those places that were furthest ahead like the Scandinavian countries on particularly gender rights, uh, that you know where the pushback is 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 uh, the most conspicuous, and it's and it's no longer just traditionally the 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 migrant or the immigrant, but it is increasingly you know other perceived uh, m- minorities. The final other that I would that I would mention, and that I think it's taking shape, you know, really under our eyes in Europe, is the kind of middle class environmentally conscious uh citizen who is you know starting to become you know a figure of of hatred um you know trying to push an environmental agenda trying to raise the alarm on climate change you know they are considered you know a kind of elite that is that also needs pushing back on how much is the rise of the far right a response to the left taking its eye off the ball. I think it's a huge part of it. I mean, it's it's quite clear. If we want to get these voters back, there needs to be a credible social offer, right? A credible offer of taking their needs, um, you know, their views uh, seriously, and you know, and and meeting these needs, and and being in conversation with with these views. It's it's really very it's really very clear. So, you know, what these parties have understood is that people want to talk about politics in a kind of um, you know more connected way, and they offer a connection which you know progressives have failed to do for a while. From the Open Society Foundation, uh, Europe and Central Asia, Catherine Fieschi, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you.